behavioral type of evidence with Alec Murdaugh. Yeah, it was not good for him. It was not good at all. He wasn't looking for the guy. He wasn't looking for the bad guy. Oh, welcome back to the Shake Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Van Shake. And if you're watching, not just listening, uh, you may notice a little bit of a change. Quite a bit of a big change here. Um, and it really is that we decided to take down the studio and throw it away. No, um, <laughs> we decided to put it into storage temporarily so we can have a little more space elsewhere and and uh, I can actually have a full room here to sleep and do everything else. So <laughs> um, that's what's going on if you're watching. It's a little different, uh, kind of just filming at my desk here. And yeah, it's kind of old times now, kind of old times. Uh, a little bit of a step back, some would say. I don't think so. I don't think so. I actually didn't think that we would take up the whole room for that long. But yeah, it turned out that the commercial space, that whole idea fell through um, because no one likes a YouTuber. No one likes us. <laughs> they don't want to lease us any space. So in lieu of that, I decided really to focus more on my schooling um, instead of actually just growing a big media company. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just really focused on school. I'm enrolled in a lot of schools. Uh, I think it's like four at this point, four schools. It's a lot. It's a lot of schools, <laughs> uh, taking a lot of, um, graduate level coursework, uh, some undergrad here and there. And it's because I am considering going to med school and don't know if I will, but just kind of going along that path to see if that is an option, if that's something I really want to do. So yeah, it's just a lot, a lot has changed um, and yeah, we don't have a lot of space, at least at this point. So once we do get more space, we will break out the studio with all the microphones and all the desks and the flashiness and it's not going anywhere, you know, we'll still have it. Yeah. So we have a few things we want to cover specifically since the last podcast, which was about, you know, about a couple months ago or so since then the Moscow PD, yes, the Moscow PD has gotten the guy. Apparently they, at least they think they got the guy. And his name is Brian Koberger. Brian Koberger. So congratulations to the Moscow PD for getting the guy. Getting a round of applause here. Round of applause. Yes, yes, yes. Congratulations. You got the guy. But will he be convicted? That's something that we will see. Um, last podcast, I was quite critical of the Moscow PD. And, you know, understandably too, right? Because things weren't making sense. And yes, maybe they were onto somebody and things like that, but nevertheless, some of the things that I did say, okay, some of the things I did say either were going on in the background and they were kind of working on that or still holds true. It still holds true. It's a fact that Moscow PD doesn't have a lot of evidence in this case. Um, okay, <laughs> let me amend that. They don't have a lot of evidence from the house We'll see what they get and what they will have once things go to the preliminary hearing and then eventually to trial, likely. We'll see. But, you know, some of the things that I said about the house, right? I mean, they only had a hundred and some odd pieces of evidence. I think it was like 130 some odd pieces of evidence in the house. That still holds true, okay? They should have more than that. I think they should. Facts. And also facts. I think if they were more seasoned at this, I think they would do a better job possibly, and they would possibly have more evidence. And that evidence is quite important, of course, to convict somebody specifically, Brian Koberger. And it turns out that he's hanging out, going to mass every Sunday, which is quite odd because I think from all accounts, he wasn't very religious before. But as I've said in a short video, a little while ago, a few months ago, that sometimes when people all of a sudden go to jail or prison, they become quite more religious 
magically. They, they, they start finding God in prison. All that time, they weren't very spiritual. They weren't very religious. And then all of a sudden, when they go to jail, they become this most godly person. It happens to everybody, practically. It seems like everyone who goes to prison, everyone who goes to jail, all of a sudden becomes much much more religious. Something also is probably not very surprising with Brian Koberger. If you've seen any of the footage of him walking to court and in court and being transported is that he's quite stone cold um, in his facial expressions and quite stone cold in his demeanor and doesn't, you know, flinch or tries not to flinch at least when everyone in the jail tries to either nag him or ask him a question or give him a little bit of hell for committing the worst murder, you know, in that whole county in many, many, many years. It's kind of surprising to me, at least, that the media didn't try to get someone caught with a misdemeanor in that county, in Latta County, Idaho, just to try to get an interview with Brian Koberger, you know? I'm kind of surprised that hasn't happened yet, but... Maybe they did try. He just wouldn't know about it if it was a fail. And then also what we're hearing from people in the prison is that Brian Koberger likes to watch himself on TV. He likes to watch his media coverage and hearing what people are saying about him. Apparently, they can choose to watch one station and everyone has to watch the same thing. And I think the guards decide who, uh, what everyone watches. And apparently... He's quite interested in his own case. And Brian Koberger, obsessed with his case, seemed to align very closely with what I mentioned on my main channel before Brian Koberger was arrested as a suspect. And that was that the person that committed these types of crimes is likely in the chat watching all the videos, watching all the coverage, and knows about you know, what's going on. And part of the reason why is because there's a lot of hubris thinking that, hey, you know, I got away with it. Additionally, what kind of uh, tactics that he can employ to keep himself out of jail, you know, and stay away from the police and keep them at distance to see where they exactly are in the investigation. Seems like at least that Brian Koberger was liking all of Maddie's photos on Instagram. Interesting, right? What does that say behaviorally? To me, behaviorally, that indicates that he wants the attention of Maddie. He's somehow wanting the attention of Maddie. And maybe he's not getting it. We don't know if she responded. We don't think she necessarily responded. But I guess he's hoping that she would take notice that he liked all of her pictures. And maybe she would reach back out to him and be like, hey, I saw you, you know, or whatever, you know, um, at least for him trying to make her know that he does exist. Very interesting behaviorally. However, before, if you recall, it seemed that Kaylee was his primary target. That's what we thought. So maybe Kaylee wasn't, or maybe it was both Maddie and Kaylee, and we don't know. You know, it's all speculation at this point. There's just not a lot of evidence that's actually out there yet. You know, we had the police affidavit, that helped a lot to give us some idea of what's going on and why they arrested Brian Koberger. We really don't have much from the police. We don't have much from the prosecutor. And we learned that the defense attorney that had represented um, some of the victim's families. Yeah. She who represented those victims' families is also representing now um, Brian Koberger, which to me seems like a conflict of interest. And of course, she doesn't want to give up the uh, Brian Koberger case, you know, so now she's just the Brian Koberger attorney and not the attorney for any of the victims' families anymore. To me, that sounds like she just wants the biggest type case, which makes sense, but it doesn't make sense that you would leave your existing clients for Brian Koberger, right? Brian Koberger is the new guy, you know, your existing clients, they need to be serviced first. You know, but to just abandon them for Brian because it's the big case that everyone's going to be watching and she wants to cover that. I think it's a really small county and a very small area and they just don't have a lot of attorneys that are suitable to do this type of work. I think that's what's going on. And maybe that's the case. I don't know, but I think it's possibly setting things up for a mistrial. And I'm sure Brian is happy to do that, you know, buying closed doors because he's just thinking like, oh, wow, 
if anything doesn't work out the way that I want, I can just claim a mistrial that my attorney represented the victim's families. So there you go. That's the mistrial right there. Um, kind of like have a mistrial in his back pocket type thing. And, you know, the attorney's happy to, to, you know, defend Brian because she wants the, all the publicity and possibly a big payday. I don't know exactly how much they pay for, you know, like a big murder trial, but I'm sure it's more than just like a traffic stop that, or any drug related charges that she may have been involved in with a victim's families. Uh, so I don't know. It's just the reality, I think, of a very small town. There are stories of things going on there that were just SMH. Shake my head. Oh my goodness. I can't believe that's actually going on in that town. Such as an attorney on a case was also the coroner for the victim in that case. I mean, how much more of a conflict can you get? <laughs> I mean, let's be real. I mean, wow. I mean, it's, first of all, it's a little odd that I guess you have someone who has medical background experience who can actually be a coroner for somebody. And then that same person also has a law degree and a, and a law license to practice law in that state. I mean, I just can't imagine. <laughs> actually having the person who does the autopsy okay of the victim also be an attorney on the case involving that victim it's just oh my gosh it's mind-boggling oh my goodness and i said in a prior podcast um and i think it holds true uh that it's possible that someone like brian koberger whoever did this whether brian did it or not the person that did this part of the calculus to target the people that he did was in the back of his mind thinking that it's a small town. It's more likely that person will get away with it if he does it in a small town as opposed to in a larger city that deals with these types of homicides all the time. Sometimes really every day they do this every day. So they're used to uh, prosecuting homicides, you know, and investigating homicides. The police are used to that, but you go to a small town, they're not used to this type of stuff. And yeah, they brought in the FBI and they had a few people working on it from the FBI, which is great. And I'm sure they were able to help out a bit, but how much, we don't know, you know, we don't really know like how much they were involved. Were they actually involved in the crime scene and kind of combing through things? Or were they just involved in more doing the, the data analysis behind the scenes to try to track down the, the perpetrator, you know, try to track down what turned out to be Brian Koberger. Was it like that? We don't know. And I guess what I'm saying with all this is that I'm kind of concerned that things are winding up and kind of moving in the direction where this could either be a mistrial or the police just don't have that much evidence because they just haven't really done many of these types of murder cases. So they're possibly missing something. We don't know. We don't know. But personally, I think that the Moscow PD did take a little bit longer to solve this or at least get their guy that they think is their guy at least right now. Okay. I believe they took a little bit longer than some other areas, which, hey, Hopefully, Brian Koberger didn't do anything else in that time frame. Hopefully. Hopefully, Brian Koberger is the guy, right? Hopefully, they have enough evidence. Hopefully. The reality is, is that they rarely come across these types of cases. So, hopefully, they have enough evidence. Hopefully, Brian Koberger is their guy, you know? It seems like it from the police affidavit. We don't know 100%, but we're going to find out what they have in June. And hopefully, it's more than just what's in the affidavit, you know, of just you know, cell phone uh, data. Oh, well, this cell phone was here and then it was there. So it has to be him. Well, unfortunately, that data can sometimes not be 100% accurate, right? It can be a little skewed, especially if he already lives not too far away from there. And you may be asking, well, what does his, you know, behavior say or his body language say? You know, what do you think based on what you're seeing of him when he is kind of being marched to court or he's in court 
or he's being transported, what does his behavior say? Um, I say it appears more guilty than innocent. The reason why I say that is because I try to think about it as myself, okay? And everyone acts differently. I get it. Everyone chooses different things, believes different ways of handling different situations. I get it. However, I think that if he was actually innocent, I think he would be saying he's innocent, okay? I know for a fact that if I was being marched to court, okay, and I had absolutely nothing to do with this, absolutely, it's a total misunderstanding, like they just plucked me out of my you know house and just like, dude, you did this. I'm like, no, I didn't. What's going on? Um, yes, I would hire a lawyer immediately because it's very serious charges and I'm being accused of very serious charges, but I would, and I could not help to actually state my innocence, not only if I were to be arrested, but also when I would be seen publicly. Okay. I would, couldn't help it. I just could not help it, you know, but maybe that's just me, but personally I could not help it, you know, to make it clear anywhere and everywhere I possibly could to make everyone hear that I am innocent. And I would probably say something like, as I'm being marched here and there, I am innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. This is a misunderstanding. I am innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. Okay. I personally would say that maybe some people would just be like, Oh, I'll just keep my mouth shut and just wait for the trial to, to, to happen. And then that'll be proven then. Um, I, I, I physically could not. Okay. Especially something like that. I mean, this is not like a traffic stop. No, no, I didn't speed. No, you got the wrong car. No, no, no. This is, you know, this is the worst thing that anyone could be accused of. Okay. And they're accusing him of it. And if he's truly innocent and absolutely had absolutely nothing at all to do with this, I feel like he would want to state his innocence early and would want to present evidence early proving that he had absolutely nothing to do with this. And it's a total misunderstanding. Personally, I would want the preliminary hearing to be immediate. I'll be like, dude, I have so much evidence. There's so much evidence of why I'm not the guy. Okay. There's so much evidence. So here it is. Here it is. You know, go check it out. Hey, look, I was here, you know, with this security footage, this security footage, my security footage, my cell phone, you know, people I talked to in that time frame, you know, it's all misunderstanding. You know, I would clear it up immediately and I could not help but to state my innocence everywhere and and as many times as I possibly could. <laughs> That's just me. I'm wondering about you all. What would you do if, say, you were Brian Koberger, but you were actually completely innocent? Would you act like Brian Koberger? Okay. Personally, I don't think, you know, someone who's very 100% innocent would act that way. Is it possible Brian Koberger was involved? And maybe, you know, he's one of the suspects or maybe hired? We don't know. But I think he's at least, at least involved because of everything we're talking about. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't think he's acting like an innocent person would given the circumstances and the seriousness of this type of crime. But it's important to note and keep in mind, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. Everyone acts differently. Okay. Everyone chooses different paths and, you know, has different decisions based on what's going on, based on their personality, based on their attorney's advice. Everyone does things differently. So, you know, he's innocent until proven guilty, but right now, based on some of the evidence, based on the way he's acting, based on the situation, it seems quite involved. That's what I think. What do you think? So speaking of behavior, something else that we want to discuss is, of course, Alec Murdaugh. Yes, he was found guilty, and that was quite relieving for me because I was quite concerned. 
I was concerned there was going to be a holdout on that jury. A lot of the people in the media said that I don't think he's going to be convicted of this. It's all circumstantial evidence. There's no way that they're going to convict him of this. There's going to be holdouts. So naturally, I was thinking too, yeah, this is going to be a holdout. This is going to be somebody who's going to say, no, no, maybe he didn't do it. No, it's possible not. We can't convict him on all circumstantial evidence. Turns out it only took him like less than three hours to convict Alec Murdoch. And of course, I'm more interested in the behavioral type of evidence. And the behavioral type of evidence with Alec Murdoch, yeah, it was not good for him. It was not good at all. I mean, there's so many things for them. He was just not acting like somebody who lost his beloved son and wife. His beloved son and wife were lost. Okay, here's why. I mean, there's so many reasons, but I'm just going to hit on the few high ones here. He wasn't looking for the guy. <laughs> he wasn't looking for the bad guy. If your wife and son were tragically murdered and you miss them both, okay, and you're devastated, you're devastated and so heartbroken and sad and just dying inside, you're naturally going to try to find the guy. You're going to try to find the murderer. <laughs> you're not going to just be like sitting back and being like, well, that's what happened. Time after time, that gives away the loved one that turned out to be the murderer. You know, we talked about this a lot in a lot of other cases where, you know, the loved one is the murderer, right? And actually, that's more common than not, okay? That the person who gets murdered likely knows the person who murdered them, especially if it was your son, your, your child that was murdered, especially them. You would want to go and find them, find who did it. Bring them to justice. Yeah? Wouldn't you? If you really were so heartbroken, so sad, so devastated that this, this monster murdered the people that you love the most, wouldn't you go after them and try to find that guy or girl or person? Right? Wouldn't you try to find them? To bring them to justice, not only so you can have justice and your family could have justice for what was done to your family and your loved ones, but also to make sure that the person who did it doesn't do it to anyone else in the area or in the, in the entire world. So some form of justice, some form of good of bringing someone to justice can actually come from something so horrible. And, you know, when he was on the, on the stand... Nothing was coming out of his mouth indicating that we want to get the guy that did it. If you notice that, right? We didn't hear that from Alec Murdoch at all. Zero, nothing, zip. That I'm on the stand here right now, okay? I'm here defending myself while the guy that did it is out there free and possibly going to do it again, okay? <laughs> that's, that's just terrible. I mean, think of the... How terrible that is if Alec Murdaugh is actually innocent, okay? And he's there defending himself when he is actually a victim in all this because his wife and son were murdered and that guy who did it is free and possibly going to do it again, right? But I guess according to the defense, it's what, just a bunch of 11-year-olds that came to his house and used his guns to do it. <laughs> it's just completely bogus. This story was bogus. The alibi was bogus. And here's the thing too, on the 911 call, you know, he was like, oh, they're shot real bad. Oh, it's real bad. I'm like, dude, you know, <laughs> if you came home and you found your wife and son murdered in that way, I mean, this is not just, oh, well, they're hit on the back of the head and, you know, they're unconscious. Okay. No, no, no. They're murdered in the most gruesome, disgusting way possible. Okay. Or at least one of them. All right. Where you know, they're just in pieces, right? In pieces. Someone who found their beloved family members like that, even a big burly guy would be in agony, okay? Gut-wrenching pain of just wanting to crawl up in a ball and die, okay? That's the feeling, okay? It's not calling on the phone and, you know, saying like, oh, yeah, they're here, and oh, I don't know if they're going to make it. Oh, it wasn't a lot of shock at all, right? There was some sadness that he was trying to convey, okay? 
but not a lot of surprise and all that shock that you would normally experience if you found your wife and son murdered in that way. You'll be so surprised, shocked, dying of emotional pain. You'll be yelling and just screaming like, oh my God, can we do this? Come here, quick, quick, please come back. You'll be crying and, and just having every bit of emotion under the sun all at the same time. Okay. Alec was very calm, very, very calm in that situation. Of course, you know, why? Because he did it. You know, he knew what happened. You know, so of course, for him, it was just like, oh, yeah, I got to put on the act now. Oh, yeah, please come quick. It's real bad. Oh, yeah, please come here. Oh, I don't know who would do this, but it happened. That's not how someone who just stumbled upon their wife and son murdered in that way would act. Keep in mind that behavioral aspect alone is not 100% proof whatsoever that he did it. It's very possible someone wouldn't act that way. But combined with everything else, it seems quite obvious that he did it, you know, because let's put it this way. It's almost like a probability, right? Say like 90% of people would act more shocked and surprised than what Alec did. So maybe Alec is just that 10%, okay, um, that doesn't act that way when he would have stumbled upon that. Okay. But then he had something else. And then it's like, oh, we'll include that evidence and include that evidence and include that evidence and include that evidence. No, help. it becomes extremely obvious. So that's how I look at things, you know, as a probability. So it's really probabilities that allow you to come to some kind of conclusion of what seemed to have happened, you know, and that's what I do, you know, peace in everything. I not only look at the behavioral stuff, you know, which I used to do a lot of body language, but also piecing in all the existing evidence that's out there and pulling it all together and being like, okay, here we go. People, I think, naturally just want the simple solution of, oh, look, his body language says this. Yeah, his body language may say this, but maybe the evidence says something else. And if that's the case, you got to sum it all together and look at you know, not just the behavioral stuff, the body language stuff, but also all the other evidence that's out there <laughs> and tie that in and see what's probable, you know, based on everything together. And that's my biggest criticism and why I moved away from body language and not wanting to be tied with body language anymore. It's because it just felt like, you know, you got a lot of people that just want to just use body language only type of thing. You know, instead of actually look at all of the evidence and tie everything together to actually come to the real truth. So, yeah, I don't do much body language anymore. I do a little bit of behavioral stuff here and there, but uh, it's just not worth being tied in with those clowns. <laughs> it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. It's kind of hard not to be a clown and do body language 100% of the time. Not everyone's lying to you. Not everyone's saying something meaningful that's insightful from their body language. But in order to make a career out of it, they have to say something insightful, impactful. They can't say, oh, well, he touched his nose because he had an itch on his nose and had nothing to do with what he was saying. You know? Um, no, it has to be impactful. No, he touched his nose because he's lying to you, that bastard. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad I'm out of that racket. I'm so out of, glad I'm out of that racket because I'm not like that. I'm not willing to say someone lied when they didn't lie. <laughs> I can't do it. It's not only immoral to do it and I can't do it morally, but technically it's also illegal. You can't do that. You can't call them a liar when there's little to no evidence of them actually lying and all they did is touch their nose or something like that. It's wrong. It's wrong in every way imaginable. You know, I believe it's wrong emotionally. It's wrong for society. It's bad for society. It's bad for the internet. It's just wrong. Also, would you like being called out as a liar if you touched your nose randomly in an interview? <laughs> I mean, come on. So I'm a lot freer now that I'm going down the intellectual path to feel like I'm moving society forward and informing people and giving good information as opposed to just going down the rabbit hole of some of these really, really annoying people on the internet. <laughs> Again, there's nothing wrong with some body language. There's nothing wrong, but there's a problem when... 
you know, you get a lot of bad people doing it that just want to make a few bucks by calling someone a liar when there's no evidence whatsoever of them being a liar. That's wrong. It's immoral. And I think it's also illegal um, because I wouldn't want that done to me. So as much as some of you may be a little annoyed that I'm not doing a lot of body language anymore, understand most of my content anyway, it wasn't a lot of body language. You know, that was just the hook for my videos, right? If you look at my videos, I did not only talk about body language. I would bring in all the evidence, clips, footage of them doing a lot of times exactly what they claim they didn't do, <laughs> you know, and to make a case and make the point. If you recall, most of the videos that were labeled body language and where I said we're going to break down body language, we only did that to supplement the evidence, to use that as an aspect of the evidence to tie it all together and find out what's really going on. It was not body language only where we only looked at body language and made a determination haphazardly just based on some nose touches and some odd smirks here and there, you know, we would bring it all together. So yeah, we're at the more intimate setting here. And I think that's better given the situation of just me, you know, having a big studio with all these chairs and microphones and it was all empty. I think that was kind of sad and kind of pointless. So um, I kind of like this more intimate feel and hopefully you all do too. More podcasts to come. Remember to subscribe. See you at the top.